So we're covering today the minor prophets. So just to go over, you know, this chart, the Pentateuch consists of five books. The historical books are 12. Poetry and wisdom are five. The major prophets, which we covered last week, was five. And the minor prophets is 12. So we're going to split that into two. We're going to cover six of the minor prophets. Now, the minor prophets, called the Book of the Twelve in the Hebrew Bible, are just as important as the major prophets. They are called minor because of the, of the shorter length of the books. They also brought God's word to the people regarding judgment and hope. So that's the only reason they're called minor prophets, not because their calling or their prophecies were minor. All the prophets of God are major, and we're going to see as we go through the major uh, minor prophets, that God always had preachers. So the prophets were like the preachers in the Old Testament to warn God's people. So the minor prophets consist of Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, and Micah. We're going to cover those six. And then Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. So the first one, Hosea. Hosea wrote it. What, what is it about? Prophecy and warning. Where in Israel? When? 752 to 722 B.C. Why? To illustrate, to illustrate Israel's spiritual adultery and warn of destruction. So the outline of Hosea is the unfaithful wife. Now God tells Hosea to marry a, 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 a woman, an a adulteress, and she keeps going out and cheating on him. And then he goes back. And, and buys her back from the marketplace, and she does it again. And that's basically an illustration to show how unfaithful Israel was. So it's almost like a, an analogy. And then the unfaithful nation, the historical purpose. First, to declare that God loved the people of Israel and longed for them to repent, to turn their hearts back to him. He had created, chosen love, and provided for them, and he desired their love in return. Second, to demonstrate by Gomer's example. Now that's Hosea's wife, Gomer. By Gomer's example, just how unfaithful Israel and Judah have been to the Lord. They have betrayed, been disloyal to, and cheated on him, just like an unfaithful spouse. They had committed act after act of spiritual adultery by worshiping false gods, the so-called gods created by the imaginations of their neighbors. They were placing in their hope in lies. So the whole marriage was basically an, an illustration between God and the children of Israel. And the doctrine or historical purpose, and we have at least four great doctrines of spiritual themes are found in the book of Hosea. The first one is the great love of, of God for his people. So you're going to see as you read Hosea, that Hosea keeps going after his wife Gomer and, and, and going after and telling her to come back home over and over again. So that portrays the love of God after his people. He keeps going after them as he does today. He keeps going after, you know, people with his love and his mercy. Second, Hosea pictures the unfaithfulness of the human race toward God, our forsaken our creator and trusting in the false gods of this world. So even God does that today. He goes after us. He sends friends, family members. You might turn on the TV. You might see a preacher, you know, telling you to repent and get right with God. You know, God goes after the human race in so many different forms, but a lot of people reject the creator and trusting in false gods of this world. So what are some of the false gods of this world? Well, money, materialism, sex, drugs, alcohol, Everything that the world offers in place of God, that is a false God because it can never fulfill the heart of a human being. But the picture is that God goes after people because God loves people, but people keep rejecting him over and over again. Third, Hosea affirms the faithfulness of God in spite of the unfaithfulness of his people. The unfaithfulness and rejection of the whole human race. Again, it shows that God is faithful. Even though Israel continue to reject God time and time again. God is still faithful in the promise he made to Abraham and in the promise he made to David, that from David's descendants, he was going to raise up the Messiah, you know, which is Jesus Christ. So God is, is still faithful to his promises. And fourth, 
the book of Hosea clearly describes the demands of God on his servants and our required obedience. So it shows us what we need to do to obey God. You know, what is God's demand on our lives? Yes, God loves us, but there's a certain way that we need to live before God. So it's not like we can live any way we want and still have the blessing of God. And a lot of people are under that delusion that God loves them so much that they can live a sinful lifestyle, a disobedient life, and they still are going to have the blessings of God. That is self-deception. God only blesses obedience. When we're obedient, he blesses us. When we're not obedient, then the devil can put a curse you know, on our lives. So we need to be obedient to the word of God. The Christological purpose or Christ-centered purpose of Hosea. Christ is the son of God called out of Egypt. Now you see that in Hosea 11.1. 1. When Israel was a child, then I loved him and call my son out of Egypt. So remember, the children of Israel were in slavery 400 years in Egypt, and God called them out of Egypt into the promised land. But then in Matthew chapter 2, verse 13 and 20, King Herod wanted to kill baby Jesus, so he had to flee to Egypt and live there until Herod died. And then it says that it was fulfilled what was spoken through the prophet, which is Hosea. Out of Egypt I call my son. So you see how that's a, a double reference. A typology there. Christ is the only Savior of God's people and the only one who redeems his people from death. Christ is also foreseen throughout Hosea as the loving, faithful husband who seeks, lives for, and sacrifices for his wife, the church, as Christ's bride. So we see that in Hosea, Christ is seen as that husband that keeps going after, you know, the wife. And in the New Testament, it's Christ going after the church. We're the bride of Christ. You know, we might sin, we might mess up, but he keeps going after us. He sends his Holy Spirit. He sends preachers. He sends brothers and sisters. You know, people our way. You might turn on the radio and hear a message, and you know that God is calling you. God uses all these different means by which he goes after his people because of his love for him. And the work of Christ is pictured in Hosea's ransoming Gomer. Just as Hosea ransomed or bought back his wife, so Christ ransomed us from sin and death, paying the penalty for our sins. So Hosea was actually looking for his wife because she left again from the house. And she was in the slave market, and he had to actually buy her back. He, he redeemed her. And that's what Christ does for us. He redeemed us from our sins. We were slaves to sin, and Christ is the only one that paid the price for our redemption, for our freedom, for our liberty. So we see that Hosea shows a type of Christ, powerful pictures, you know, so that's why the Old Testament is very important. It pictures, you know, what God does in the New Testament through Christ. And the key verse in Hosea, because you have rejected knowledge, I also reject you as my priest, because you have ignored the law of your God, I will also ignore your children. So this is God saying, look, if you reject me, I'm going to reject you. If you're obedient, then I'm going to bless you. So that's the first book of the minor prophets, Hosea. And now we come to the prophet Joel. And what is it about? Prophecy and judgment. Where was he in Judah? When? Unknown. To call Judah to repentance in order to avoid ju judgment. And you're going to see that theme throughout the major prophets, the minor prophets, and even the prophets that did not write any prophetic books in the Old Testament, because there's a lot of prophets in the Old Testament that didn't write prophetic books of, of, of prophecy, is the same theme, God calling people to repent of their sins, to turn away, warning them from the judgment to come. But the people back then are just like we are today, stubborn, you know, hard-hearted. We want to have it our way. We don't listen. God has to tell us again and again, and finally, you know, we get it right. You know, so human nature never changes. And that's why the Bible is so interesting to, to read, because even the Old Testament, you see that human nature hasn't changed in thousands of years. People are still hard-headed, they're still stubborn, and God is still calling them to repent. So chapter 1, the locusts, you know, they devoured the land, and then blessing and curses, chapter 2 to 3. The historical purpose. In other words, why did Joel 
Joel wrote this book, the immediate historical purpose of Joel was to turn the hearts of God's people back to the Lord. Again, calling back to repentance. The land of Judah was in the midst of a devastating crisis, famine and starvation caused by a swarm of locusts. Joel's purpose was to make it totally clear that this was not a random act of nature. Rather, it was a direct act of God's judgment. It was God's purpose through Joel to rouse the people from sin and spiritual indifference and cause them to repent. So Joel is writing historically to show them, look, the locusts have devoured the land. They ate all the fruits, the plants, everything. The locusts just took over the land. Joel is showing them that, look, if you don't obey God, the whole land is going to be devastated. It is an act of God, again, trying to get their attention to repent. The doctrinal purpose or spiritual purpose, the book of Joel is consistent with other books of prophecy. It contains the basic pattern and key themes presented throughout the Old Testament. These are the message of warning of God's judgment for sin, punishment, discipline, and chastisement. Again, the message of warning, the command or call to repent. And then the promise of forgiveness and future blessing for the repentant, deliverance, salvation, and restoration. So we see that repentance is not a New Testament word, that Jesus came and he said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. John the Baptist came in the scene and he said, repent and believe in Christ. But the word repent, it's not a New Testament word that's been around, you know, even from the Old Testament. God's desire was always for his people to repent of their sins and turn back to him. Now that word repent means to change your mind. You do a 180, not a 360, because you're going to end up back in the same place where you were. But you repent means to do a 180. You're heading towards one direction. You repent of your sins and you say, God, forgive me. I don't want to live like this anymore. I give my life over to you. You turn around and you head the other direction towards God. That's what repentance means. Repentance does not just mean that you ask God to forgive you for your sins. And then you go on in that same direction. The word repentance means, yes, you confess your sins, but then you forsake them. You turn around and you head towards God's direction. So you're heading towards one direction. You turn around, you head towards God's direction. That's what repent means. And I want to make that clear because a lot of people say, well, I tell God to forgive me every day. I pray at night and I tell him, Lord, forgive me for my sins. But the next day they're doing the same thing. And the next day they do the same thing. And it's a pattern. So in their heart, did they really repent of their sin? And biblically, the answer is no, because repentance always means a change of mind, a change of direction, a change of heart. So that's what God is calling the people to do in Joel and throughout the Old Testament. Now, the Christological Christ-centered purpose of Joel. Christ is the one who gives the Holy Spirit. In Joel chapter 2, verse 28, talks about the Holy Spirit you know, being poured out on all people. And we're going to read that as the key verse. So Christ is the one that gives the Holy Spirit. Christ is the one who would judge the nations. The Bible says that God is going to judge the world through that man which he has chosen, which is Jesus Christ. Everyone's going to stand before God. The Bible says in Hebrews, it is destined for a person to die once and after that face judgment. So people are going to receive Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. Or they're going to see Christ as their judge. And books are going to be open. And if their names are not written in the Lamb's Book of Life, they're going to be cast into the lake of fire. So everyone is going to see Christ. Everyone's going to receive Christ, whether as their Savior or as their judge. Because remember, sin has to be judged. And God did that already on the cross when he sent his son to die for our sins. So when we receive Christ, we, he already paid the penalty for our sins, and we're forgiven. So now he becomes our Savior. But for those who reject Christ and don't repent, they're still going to uh, see Christ. They're still going to see Christ face to face in the judgment seat of Christ. And there they're going to be judged. So I always encourage people, receive Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. You don't want to stand in the day of judgment without having your sins forgiven and you lived any way you want to here on this earth, and all he can look at you and tell you your name is not written in the book of life, and then he, they have to toss you to the lake of fire. That's going to be a horrific day for people who don't know the Lord. Christ is the one who pardons and forgives sin. You know, we see that throughout the 
New Testament, Matthew 9, 6, Acts 5, 31, only Christ can forgive sins because he was God manifested in the flesh. There was no greater feeling than to have your sins forgiven. Everything that you have done in your past, the guilt, the shame, the condemnation, the burden of sin, the anger, the frustration, the bitterness, all that that lives inside of human beings because, you know, people don't deal with issues. The only way to alleviate yourself off of all those sins is by receiving Christ into your life and asking him to forgive you for your sins. And all of a sudden, that burden is released. He's the only one that can forgive sins because sin is directed towards him. When we lie, we might lie to people, but we're lying before God. When we steal, we might steal you know, something from a person, but we're stealing in the eyes of God. So we're not breaking man's commandment. We're breaking God's commandment. And we're all going to be held accountable for that. And that's why it's important for us to share the gospel with those who are not Christians so that they can know to flee from the wrath to come, to flee from the judgment to come to receive Christ in their life as their Savior, because one day they're going to face him in the day of judgment. And if their names are not written in the book of life, they will be tossed to the lake of fire. Christ is the one who will establish God's kingdom on earth, an eternal kingdom of peace and abundance. So all that you see in Joel, and then here, here are the scriptures, the New Testament scriptures that confirm that. And now the key verse in Joel is, and afterward, I will pour my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Now, this is an important verse because the apostle Peter on the day of Pentecost, when he receives the baptism of the Holy Spirit and begins to speak in tongues, there were 120 believers there in the upper room. They all got filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other tongues. And a lot of people said, these guys are drunk. You know, they're full of new wine. You know, they, they're acting weird. And then Peter gets up and says, we are not drunk, as you suppose. It is only nine in the morning. And then he quotes this verse. He says, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, that in the last days I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams, and your young men will see visions. So we see the apostle Peter in Acts chapter 2 quotes this exact verse. So Joel is prophesying about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that is going to come in the New Testament when people receive Christ and then afterwards get baptized or filled with the Holy Spirit. And then we have the prophet Amos. What is it about prophecy and judgment? We're in Israel, 760 to 753 BC, to accuse and judge Israel for injustice and lack of mercy. The outline, Neighbors Punished, chapter 1, Israel's Destruction, 2 and 8, and the Future Hope, chapter 9. The historical purpose. Amos' immediate purpose was to call the people of Israel to repentance and obedience. As mentioned above, Israelite society had become spiritually and morally bankrupt. The people were gripe, gripped by a spirit of materialism, complacency, and greed. Though the Lord had blessed the nation materially, the people were not using their wealth for the benefit of one another, nor for the glory of God. Instead, they ignored God's word, heaping sin upon sin, and were guilty of all sorts of evil. Now, these are the types of evils that Amos mentions that they were involved in. Adultery and incest, misplaced trust and pride, insincere worship and hypocrisy, greed, self-indulgence and dishonesty, hoarding wealth, neglect of the poor, injustice, exploitation and oppression, an evil example, wicked testimony, all these different things. So we can go through this list and you see there is no different today. People committing adultery, incest, sexual immorality, you know, sleeping around, you know, misplaced trust, insincere worship and hypocrisy. Millions of people go to church every Sunday, you know, when the buildings were open for a ceremonial uh, uh, act. You know, to just, just to follow rules and regulation. And they walk right out and then live any way they want to live. In other words, it's not from their heart. So we see all these sins today. Nothing changes with human nature. We're still self-centered without Christ. We're still selfish if we don't have Christ. The doctrine of spiritual purpose, we see sin and judgment. 
the necessity of repentance, again, the same thing. The inadequacy of false, insincere religion, and that is true today. There are so many different religions in the world, and they're inadequate. They're insincere. They're phony. It's not having a relationship with God. God is not into religion and rituals and ceremonies. God is into having a relationship with his creation through Jesus Christ. There's a difference between religion and relationship. Religion means that you, let's just say you grew up in a certain, like Roman Catholicism. You know, you grew up in that, you went to mass, you gave money, you did your confirmation there and all these different things. That's all outward. Those are things you did outwardly, but inside there was no change in your heart. Inside there was no transformation. You know, that's inadequate or false, insincere religion. It was just an outward show, but you still did your own thing. There was no true repentance. Social, economic, and legal justice. That's what you see in Amos, but you see the opposite, injustice and uh, illegal stuff going on. The danger of wealth and complacency, just like today. He's dealing with the same things people deal with today. So if Amos was alive today, he still will be a powerful a prophet and a preacher preaching to this generation. But that's why God has his own preachers in the New Testament, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. The Christological Christ-centered purpose. Like the prophet Joel, Amos does not mention the Messiah or Jesus Christ directly. But the kingdom of Christ is clearly pictured in the promise of Israel's restoration. Christ is the one who will establish God's kingdom on earth an eternal kingdom of peace and prosperity. So it mentions him indirectly. Christ is the only one that's going to establish that eternal kingdom. The key verse in Amos is, Seek good, not evil, that you may live. Then the Lord God Almighty will be with you, just as you say he is. Simple, right? Seek good not evil, that you may live. In other words, if we keep the commandments of God, we will live. If you don't, then, you know, trouble comes. And that's the message of the prophets, on and on and on. And now Obadiah, again, what is it about prophecy? These are predictions. Where was in Judah, 586 BC, the prophecy against Edom. Now, Edom was one of the enemies of the Jews. Judgment on Edom, chapter 1 through 9. Edom's violation, 10 to 14. Israel's victory, 15 to 21. So it didn't only speak to the people of Israel. It also spoke to other nations. Like here we see Edom, you know, uh, being judged. And they're going to experience the, the wrath of God. And, and God is really going to correct them and judge Edom because they hated the Jews. The Edomites were one of Israel's longest standing enemies, and more prophecies are directed against this nation than any other in Scripture. Their animosity can be traced all the way back to Jacob and Esau living in the patriarchal age. Esau was the father of the Edomites. After Esau's many conflicts with Jacob, he settled in the land of Zer. Zer and Mount Zer then became synonymous with Edom. So the Edomites were actually descendants of Esau. And if you read, you know, Genesis, you see that Jacob and Esau were brothers and Jacob stole Esau's birthright and they had conflict, those two brothers. And, you know, the Edomites are descendants of uh, Esau and they hated the Jews, you know, and here God is judging the Edomites. The doctrinal spiritual purpose of Obadiah, the central and unmistakable message of Obadiah is that the enemies of God and his people will be severely judged. Those who scorn, mock, or ridicule God's people. Those who hate, begrudge, or disdain God's people. Those who abuse, use, or mistreat God's people. Those who exploit, cheat, or oppress God's people. Those who slander, bear false witness against, or unjustly treat God's people. Those who murder, intimidate, or physically harm God's people. So God was judging Edom or the Edomites because of everything they did to Israel. They were the enemies of Israel. You know, and again, they wouldn't repent. Now, in the New Testament, the Bible says to love our enemies and pray for those who despitefully use us. So our, in our hearts, we shouldn't have an intention for God to punish, you know, our enemies. But in the end, 
the Bible says, vengeance is mine, I will repay. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Not that we wish ill will towards our enemies or the people of the world. We want them all to be saved. But at the end, God is the one that's going to take vengeance uh, on you know, what they do to his people and how they treat his church and, and the Christians. Leave that all in the hands of God. You pray for them and love them that God will save them. But in the end, God is sovereign and he'll do according to his will. The Christological Christ-centered purpose. As in the books of Joe and Amos, there is no explicit mention of Christ or the Messiah in Obadiah. However, Christ and his kingdom are clearly pictured in the promise given to Israel. A faithful believing remnant will inherit the lands formerly held by their enemies. In Christ's kingdom, the kingdom of God, will be established in Zion. So you can read that in the book of Obadiah. The key verse, because of the violence against your brother Jacob, you will be covered with shame. You will be destroyed forever. Obadiah chapter 10. And now we're going to Jonah. Now a lot of people are familiar with the story of Jonah. The story of God's mercy, where in Nineveh, 783 to 753 B.C., to show that God loves all. Powerful book. Jonah flees, chapter 1, Jonah prays, chapter 2, Jonah's anger with God's mercy. So God calls Jonah to preach to the Ninevites, and he goes reluctantly. A, a fish swallows him, and then the fish you spits him back out, and then he goes and preaches. And in 40 days, Nineveh shall be destroyed. The people there repent and turn to God, and God saves them. The historical purpose, Jonah's message of judgment was preached in Nineveh to bring the people to repentance. To remind Israel of God's great love for all people, even their enemies. It is notable, even shocking, that the Lord called Jonah to go to Nineveh in Assyria. Now, this is important because if you've been following the, the Old Testament, the Assyrians were the ones that took captured, you know, Israel in the north. They took them captive into Assyria and then they scattered them throughout the nation. So Assyria was an enemy of Israel. But here God is saying, go preach to them. I love them as well. Give them a chance to repent. Nineveh is just the capital of Assyria. So they have a huge kingdom there. Just as Jonah repented from his disobedience and hard-heartedness, so it was God's desire that all Israel repent. Historically, the people have shown little concern for the souls of other people and nations. Like Jonah, they were callous and hard-hearted. So the Jews were supposed to be a witness to all the nations around them, and they didn't do that. The doctrinal spiritual purpose. It reminds us, Jonah reminds us of the Lord's desire for all people to be saved, even our enemies. It is God's will that no one should perish, but that all sh people should come to repentance. Even the Assyrians, you know, even the Ninevites to come to repentance. So it was, only, it was not only repentance for Israel and that's it. God's heart has always been for the nations. Jonah also reminds us of the radical love of God. The Lord desired mercy for the Assyrians more than judgment. And that's God's heart, always mercy, not judgment. But if a nation or people continue to reject him, then he's left, left with no other, other remedy than to bring judgment, but always mercy. Jonah further reminds us of our own need to repent. Jonah powerfully demonstrates the sovereignty of God. God's plans will not be ruined or stopped. Israel was failing in her, in her mission to be a light to the world. So God's sovereignty, Israel was supposed to be a witness and a light to the other nations and show them that Yahweh is the true God. You serve him and he'll bless you. But they didn't do that. They were caught up with their own lifestyle and their own sins. And they actually started adopting the, the customs of other nations, worshiping idols and sacrificing their children in the fire and all these different abominations. So we see here God's sovereignty. Israel was not a witness, so I'm going to send Jonah to go preach and be a witness there and tell them and warn them. And Jonah did warn them. In 40 days, Nineveh is going to be destroyed. The king made a law and said, look, everybody fast. Everybody, even animals, everybody. Don't give any food. Let's see if God will have mercy. And God did have mercy and saved the Ninevites. The Christological purpose Christ's love for sinners is pictured in God's great love for the Ninevites. Despite the Ninevites' wickedness, God determined to show them mercy. Just as Christ showed us mercy while we were yet sinners. Thus, God's mercy in Christ, which has been extended to all humankind, is foreshadowed by God's mercy to Nineveh. And again, the Assyrians were a barbaric people. They used to capture people 
and torture them. They used to rip their fingers off, cut off their ears. They were brutal type of people that you would see, see, see them and be like, they, don't, they shouldn't be witness to. They don't need repentance, you know. But God's mercy, even for the most vilest people at that time, shows his mercy and his love. Go warn them. This was going to happen if they don't repent. So again, we see God's love and mercy for other nations. The death and resurrection of Christ are pictured by Jonah's three days in the belly of the whale. In the same sense that Jonah was brought back from death and the pit of hell on the third day, Christ was brought back from the grave and resurrected to eternal life on the third day. What a glorious hope for the believer. So Jonah being in the belly of the whale for three days pictures Christ. And exactly in Matthew chapter 12, verse 40, Jesus said this, just as Jonah was in the belly of the whale three days and three nights, so the Son of Man will be in the heart of the earth three days and three nights. So we see it pictures that. Jonah, key verse, I knew that you are gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, now this is Jonah saying this. He said, Lord, I didn't want to come here because, look, you forgave them, and I knew you were going to forgive them. And here I am wasting my time. But in reality, Jonah wanted to see them destroyed. And that's why when he went to preach, he went across and sat under a tree and looked towards the city to see if God was going to destroy it. So in his heart, he really wanted destruction. But then he quotes this and says, I knew you were gracious and compassionate. You were going to forgive him anyway, Lord. So Jonah, it's not a good witness either. You know, he went reluctantly and, and fighting with God, but God always has his way. And now Micah, this is the sixth book of the Minor Prophets. Again, prophecy and judgment, Israel and Judah, 738, 698 BC, to warn people of judgment and to offer hope. Judgment and deliverance, chapter 1 through 5, confession and restoration, 6 through 7. The historical purpose of Micah, Micah was from Judah, but his message targeted both Israel and Judah. His purpose was to expose the people's sins and bring them to repentance. He ministered in the days of peace and prosperity, but Judah and Israel were far from peaceful. Social unrest stirred beneath the surface of good times. The doctrine of spiritual purpose, his message teaches several essential truths. Individual behavior matters, social behavior and social systems matter, leadership and integrity of, of leaders matter, justice and concern for the poor matter, Sincere faith and worship matter. Obedience to God and his word matters. So you read Micah, he's going to be dealing with all these things. Leadership, social issues, you know, sincere worship, individual behavior, and obedience to God. And then the Christological or Christ-centered purpose. Christ, the ruler of his people, will be born in Bethlehem. So that's a, a prophecy that he was going to be born in Bethlehem. Christ, the liberate, will free his people from sin and all bondages. You can read that in Micah chapter 2, verse 2 and 13. Christ the shepherd will care, care for and guide his people. Christ the judge of the nations will conquer God's enemies and establish peace. So that's what the book of Micah teaches you about Christ as you read it. Christ the cleanser will purify his people from sin. And Micah's key verse, he has shown you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? And I love this verse because some people say, well, I don't know what God requires of me. Well, here, it can't get any clearer than this. This is what the Lord requires of you, to act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. So that is the first six books of the Minor Prophets. And I encourage you to read them and really get, get into them so that you can see their, their prophecies and all the different doctrinal teachings that you can receive from this uh, uh, prophetic books, even though they're written for a long time, it's still God's word and it still speaks to us even to this day. So I want to encourage you for those who will be listening later on uh, online or on Facebook, if you have not received Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, I encourage you that that is the most important decision that you will ever make in your life. And I'm not just talking about saying a prayer, you know, and, and, and Thinking is magic. I'm talking about turning your life completely over to Christ and saying, Christ, I'm going to follow you all the days of my life. Forgive me for my sins. Write my name in the book of life. Help me understand the Bible. And as you read the Bible, you obey it and you live an obedient life. And little by little, God will begin to cleanse you. God will begin to change your life.
But the main thing you need to do is to get saved, to become born again. And immediately, instantly, that happens instantly. As soon as you repent of your sins and turn to God and turn away from sin, and you receive Christ into your life, instantly your sins are forgiven and you become born again. You become a new creation in Christ. So I encourage you to do that. That's the most important thing any human being can ever make here on this earth is get their heart right with God through Jesus Christ. I love you. Uh, hopefully see you next week. So now we're just going to end the broadcast.